Listen now to God's holy, inerrant, and life-giving word, beginning at verse 1 of Mark 11. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said and they let let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Father, we thank you for the record, the inspired record of our Lord, and we thank you for uh, his, uh, his sovereignty as Savior and his resolve that he would do the work that you've given him to do. Help us to be reminded of his ability and his willingness to save us to the uttermost. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. There's not many episodes in the four that are found in all four of the Gospels, and this is one of them. Uh, of the miracles, I, I'm pretty sure the only miracle that's in all four Gospels is the feeding of the 5,000. As we, we covered that, it's a big theological event. That's the wrapping up of the first phase of his ministry where he's declaring himself publicly. Um, and another one is the triumphal entry. It's a very significant event. And I think it's rightly compared to Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon. You may know the situation with Julius Caesar. He was declared an outlaw by his political enemies who'd taken over the Roman Senate. And if he crossed into Italy, then he'd be uh, an enemy of the state. And that line was the, the Rubicon, the River Rubicon. And he cast, he said the die is cast. And he, we, we have the expression, crossing the Rubicon. And that is committing yourself to a course of action at which point it's, it's no longer uh, remediable. It's an irrevocable, irrevocable crossing of a line. And Jesus is certainly doing that. This is not just a benign, he happened to be going up to Jerusalem. In fact, this is the careful end of a nine-month journey. It was nine months earlier when after the Mount of Transfiguration, which really was a transition of his ministry, uh, you have uh, the great, after he feeds the 5,000 and, and, and the previous year's Passover, And then he takes the disciples, he takes them on a holiday to Caesarea Philippi with all of its temples and in the presence of the gods of the world. He says, who do you say that I am? And Peter gives the great confession, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Shortly after that, the three go up on Mount Hermon and there's a transfiguration. And then as Luke puts it, he set his face to Jerusalem. But it was a nine month zigzag journey. And one of the reasons, it seems, why it was such an odd journey is he was timing it to arrive now. It's the beginning of the feast week of that fateful Passover. And uh, one thing you're seeing here is Jesus' mastery of the circumstances, of his sovereignty over it. Uh, There's always a sort of liberal theology that wants to say that, well, Jesus was an unfortunate victim. No, no, he had orchestrated it. He had timed it, and he is, in this episode, he is very deliberately provoking what will happen that Good Friday, later that next week, when they put him to death on the cross. He is fulfilling his mission. Now, this passage breaks out into a few sections. The first are Jesus' preparation for it, he, namely his instruction for them to go to Bethphage and find this donkey colt. Now, as he's drawing near, uh, Bethany is a town about two miles outside of, of Jerusalem on the route up from, it's a big uphill route, from uh, Jericho. And of course, he's If you know, he'd stopped there at Bethany for some time. In John's gospel, you have the dramatic raising of Lazarus from the dead, which was a colossal event. Jesus did that 
right outside in the suburbs of Jerusalem, he raises a man from the dead and, and there's a big crowd. It's a well-known event. And Beth Shephaz is, is a hamlet between Bethany and Jerusalem and Jesus gives them the instructions, go into that hamlet and you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat and uh, untie it and bring it uh, to me. And, and if anybody says to you, what are you doing? Say, the Lord has need of it. He will return it to you. And then as I read, that is exactly what happened. Now, interesting, even some evangelical commentators go, Jesus must have made some arrangement. He knew the guy. He knew it was there. I don't read the text that way at all because they seem to be totally surprised by it. This is him sovereignly as in his deity. Uh, he has arranged for this colt of a donkey. He doesn't say donkey here, but John's gospel makes it perfectly clear that it was a donkey. Um, and, um, uh, and he's made all the arrangements. Now, one of the significant features is that it's a colt uh, on which no one has ever sat. Now, the reason that that's an, an interesting detail is in the Old Covenant, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy all specify that if you're going to use an animal for a sacrifice, that animal cannot previously have been put to secular use. So you don't offer a sheep that's been sheared for two or three years. Uh, it's animals that have been set aside strictly for sacred use. Now, this is not an animal you sacrifice, but Jesus is associating himself with the sacrificial logic as he's going in. Now, he doesn't make a big deal of that publicly, but the disciples know it. And as he's been doing all along, Jesus wants his believers, those closest to him, to know that there's a sacrificial motif uh, from the very beginning to his coming into Jerusalem. Moreover, he is going public. This is, Jesus is not, it's interesting, during one of the previous feasts, uh, uh, I think it's the Feast of Tabernacles two years earlier. Uh, he didn't go to the, 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 to the festival uh, initially. He didn't do it in a public way. And he went there secretly. And his, remember his brothers, this is John 7, they had said, why aren't you going down there making a big show? And Jesus said, well, because it's not time. And the Pharisees, that, that was a time of, where there was a great conflict and they wanted to arrest him. He did go. But he went there secretly, and that, that leads to John 8, where at the Feast of the Lights, at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, he gives the great I am the light of the world speech. Actually, in the, in the Court of the Women, in John 7, he does the, if anyone is thirsty, during the, the water pouring episode. So, but he, he's doing those things, but he's, he's, he's showing up suddenly and then kind of disappearing. Well, not this time. Now he is deliberately going public with who he is. And I think it's noteworthy that uh, uh, every, all of his arrangements work out. There is the cult right where he said it was. Uh, and it's clear to me that there was not an arrangement. And the people, here you are, someone's, someone's got the key to your car in your driveway. Uh, why, why are you getting my car? The Lord has need of it. Now it is certainly true that as I already said, the, the episode in Bethany with the raising of Lazarus had uh, Jesus on the minds of the people. Maybe it's helpful to realize probably the probable attendance at the Feast of Passover would have been a quarter million men. So it's the, this is like a city that during this feast time is just bursting to the gills. A huge influx of pilgrims. That's not the normal population. It's a massive swelling. And Jesus is on their lips. And he has now made these arrangements. Now, what is the point of his manner of coming in? Well, first of all, he is riding in. Um, you didn't ride into Jerusalem as a pilgrim. You walked up to Jerusalem. You think of the songs of Psalms of Ascent. I often think of the beginning of the worship service. Usually the opening hymn of a service is very often it's a psalm actually, or it's almost always a general praise. I, I, what I'll often do is I'll say, okay, what's kind of the theme of the sermon? Let me find, it's the sovereignty of God, I find a sovereignty hymn. But the idea at the beginning of the service is one of just general praise. And I often picture at the beginning of the service the, the, the people of Israel going up the mount 
up to the temple, and that's how we begin our service. The, the, the old covenant worship model is the model for reformed worship. And then we, they made a sacrifice, we confess our sins, receive a pardon. Um, but Jesus is not walking up, he is riding in. And moreover, he is riding in on a donkey. Now it just so happens that my devotions right now are in 1 Kings. And I, uh, uh, at the beginning of 1 Kings, you have the whole episode of Adonijah's rebellion, yet another son of David who's rebelling against his father, and he's got Joab and the other cronies trying to pull a coup. And what does David do to preempt Adonijah's revolt against Solomon? He puts him on a donkey and has him ride through the streets of Jerusalem. That was the mount of the Davidic dynasty. Nobody else rode donkeys around that way. Even you get uh, the sons of, uh, would, would ride the donkeys from place to place. It, it had been done before. There's a couple of places in Judges. But it was, a, it was an emblem of the Davidic dynasty that you come riding in on a donkey. And of course, if you go to Zechariah 9, this is a very striking fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, Zechariah, of course, is written at a time where there is not a functioning kingship. The, the priests are in charge. This is the post-restoration. And he makes this prophecy, a famous prophecy, rejoice, Zechariah 9.9, greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. Oh, okay, so this is a the restoration of Jerusalem, they're trying to rebuild the temple, they're reestablishing what had been lost. Remember Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed the city, he carried off the Davidic kings into exile. There was the line of David, but there was no kingship. And so Zechariah, the major prophet, I love Zechariah, of the, of, of the restoration community says, no, your king is coming to you. Okay, what will identify our king when he comes? Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Donkey. And so Jesus is coming in such a manner that he is deliberately going public with his claim to be the messianic king. And dare I say, he is provoking the wrath of the Pharisees who understand the claim that Jesus is making. Um, now, um, uh, one of the features of that, of course, is the kind of king that he is claiming to be. Uh, the people respond with shouts of Hosanna, and they're quoting from passages from the Psalms. I think it's right that it's an antiphonal, antiphonal singing. Hosanna means save now. And then another part will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. These are lines from Psalm 118, although other Psalms as well. And uh, this is what they're doing. They're, 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 it's a worship choir. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of the kingdom of our father David. And then the answer, Hosanna in the highest. This is what this crowd, and it would not have been a small crowd. Because uh, actually we're told in John, uh, uh, John 12, 18, that the crowd had heard that this man had raised someone from the dead. There were witnesses. Remember, there were people who came and there were witnesses to Jesus. That was the, maybe the most public of all his miracles right outside Jerusalem at a time when he knew the Pharisees were about to close the deal on his, on his uh, assault. Uh, he raises Lazarus from the dead and then there's people there who see it. Lazarus himself, in fact, one of the it would be comical if it weren't so wicked and evil. You know what the Pharisees decided they were going to kill, they were not going to kill just Jesus. Who else were they going to kill? Lazarus. You got to get rid of the evidence. And so here Jesus raises Lazarus, and Lazarus is being seen and telling people. Wouldn't that be interesting? You know, uh, uh, people say, what's it like to die? I don't know, but Lazarus knew. <laughs> but uh, the... Um, and the, he is provoking the, really the people and also the, uh, the Pharisees and the, and, the, and the scribes. Now, one of the details that is found in Mark, it's more clear in John, they spread their cloaks on the road. That's a statement of homage. Uh, it's a statement of, of aligning themselves to his party. 
It's like showing up at the ticker tape parade of, or going to the national convention of your party and, you know, and donating money uh, to your candidate. They're, they're laying their cloaks before him, so they're aligning with him, and they're putting palm branches on the road in front of him. Now, you've probably heard me say this, I think I said it recently in one of my Mark messages, but the palm branches, there's no, there's not, no doubt at all what that's the emblem of. It is the emblem of the Maccabean Revolt. Uh, particularly the second Maccabean revolt in the second century where uh, the, uh, 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 the palm branch was the emblem of the revolt, in that case against the Assyrian pagan overlords. Um, and in fact, when the Hasmonean dynasty, that was the, I hope you know something about the Maccabees, the first, third and second century BC during uh, Antiochus Epiphanes with the abomination that causes desolation. This is a Greek ruler and he, the terrible persecution that is a prelude of the final persecution before Jesus returns and he commits the abomination that causes desolation. He sacrificed a pig in the Holy of Holies and this terrible persecution and Judas Maccabeus leads the revolt against him, Judas the hammer, and then that becomes the Hasmonean dynasty. On their coins was found the palm branch, the emblem of the zealot party in Jesus' time was the palm branch. And so they are looking for a Messiah who is going to come and who is going to give them the end times victory now. And they were looking for Jesus to be Messiah, but, the, the, but they were asking him to save them not from their sins, but from their political, military, economic enemies. Uh, the New Testament says that Jesus came the first time to deal with sin, the second time to grant that kind of salvation. Jesus is going to come back. Read Revelation 19 when he comes on a war horse with a sword and he will tread the winepress of the wrath of God. What they were hoping for was going to happen. The problem was they didn't know that they needed to be uh, forgiven of their sins. They, they weren't conscious of their, their guilt. They were the righteous people and the Romans were the unrighteous and Jesus as he comes in on a donkey, is not only claiming his Davidic lineage, he is rejecting that kind of Messiah. Now, I think that's very relevant for us today because it's very easily, and with good impulses, uh, but it's easy for Christians to make the culture war our primary purpose. You and I are living in a time that's just insane. Uh, should the Lord tarry, it'll be interesting to read the histories about the years in which you and I are living with the, the assault on basic, mor you know, the, the moral consensus of at least 2,000 years, uh, and with the, the promotion of homosexuality, all the, all the sexual, all the gender things going on. And it's very easy for Christians to think that what this is about is we've got to win the culture war. Um, Look, the culture war is real. I honor Christian politicians who have a vocation to be involved in the political process. We pray for them. You know, I've, I sometimes can be seen at lunches they, they hold. And, I, you know, I, uh, I'm not indifferent to uh, an attempt to defend our freedoms and, and biblical morality. It is not, however, the mission of the church. The mission of the church is the proclamation of Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord. The thing that always must be done is the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus to free us from our sins. And there are secular vocations that other people have, but it is not the gospel. It is not the work of the, uh, of the Christian identity. I think one of the great crises of our time, and it's not completely our fault, our opponents are engaged in a lot of misrepresentation. Don't you love it when they get the, uh, the Westboro Baptist Church? How many people are actually in Westboro Baptist Church? 50? But they're on the, you know, they're, every time they do something, every time they launch some evil, hateful pro, you know, lately they've been going to soldiers' funerals and holding up signs, he's going to hell. <laughs> There's the Christian witness, according to CNN, you know. But I think we do bear a burden as well. It's, I, frankly, I'm, Personally, I am less concerned about who wins the election. I care who wins elections. I'm more concerned that Christians accurately represent Jesus Christ and that the word of God be displayed. I think one of the crises of our time is I don't think even well-meaning secularists know what we believe. I think the political agenda, 
because it's so heated, and again, I'm not saying it doesn't matter, I'm not saying Christians shouldn't be involved, but uh, we don't want to be on the wrong side of Palm Sunday. <laughs> we don't want that the palm leaf of the zealot party to be that which is our identity. It is, in fact, the, the one riding on the donkey. And, of course, Jesus is declaring his meekness, and Zechariah said he comes humble, riding on a donkey. And, and the, the contrast is striking. You know, worldly conquerors don't come riding on donkeys. I, 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 when I was, before I was a Christian, I was a military officer, and I was a little bit into Napoleon because, I mean, he's the bomb when it comes to military tactics. I mean, you know, Genghis Khan, Napoleon, Alexander, I mean, these are the guys, you know. I haven't seen a portrait of any of them riding a donkey. Have you? I'm still waiting on the Napoleon portrait on a donkey coming in humbly. That's not the deal. Uh, Sinclair Ferguson points out that Mark was, was written to the church that lived in Rome. And people in Rome were used to seeing the Roman triumphs. And the Roman triumph involved, you know, when they had these triumphs, they would come in. In fact, one of the big ones they had was Titus after the destruction of Jerusalem. The Arch of Titus still has the emblems of all that. And they had their captives and all their thousands in front of them. And in all his glory, there's the conqueror with the laurel leaf on his head. And the enemy kings, you know, are in chains before him. It's power, it's glory, it's might, it's all of the, the, the deifying of the conqueror. Jesus comes in on a donkey. The colt, a foal of a donkey. He comes because his is a kingdom of peace. He came not to uh, deliver a military triumph to one earthly party or another, but he came to, to bring peace. Uh, uh, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, for I am gentle of heart. I am meek, Jesus said. One of the most wonderful, compelling things about the Lord Jesus is the meekness and the humility of his person. You know, I sometimes think, what would it be like actually to have seen Jesus in his incarnation. You know, we're going to see him in his glory, in his exalted glory. And, and I never want to say it's better to have been there than to have the scriptures. Actually, the apostles say it's better to have the scriptures than to have been there. Um, but I still wonder what would it have been like to actually have seen God the Son incarnate. And... Um, the biblical portraits would have said we would have been impressed by his humility, by his meekness. We don't associate that with glory, but the Bible associates that with glory. Jesus comes on an animal who has the characteristic of that which qualifies one for a sacrifice. He comes not on a war charger. He comes on a donkey. He is coming as the prophesied king, and from where is he going to, to reign? He's going to reign from the cross. And this is why I just think in this whole passage, this whole milieu of it, our message is the cross. Our message to our enemies. Uh, you know, you've probably heard the story, I think it's an edifying one, of, a, of an abortion clinic where uh, the lines were drawn. It's probably 10 years, maybe it's 15 years ago now. Uh, and it was this really heated, ugly thing, and they were probably, I think Christian protest was on one side, but it was not going well, and there were some, you know, rather uh, uh, in-your-face placards on either side. It was a very combative thing in the media, and I, I'm, I, I, it's been verified this is a true story. Uh, finally, a Christian was parked their car next to one of the abortion doctors, and they parked and were walking together, and the Christian said, how is this for you? And the person broke down in tears, and ultimately that, that she led that abortion doctor to Jesus. Now, did I just say that we should just be easy going about abortion? I did not say that. I am not opposed to people lawfully protesting it. I am saying our message is Jesus as the Savior of sin. And we must not let that be obscured amidst the Palm Sunday scenery that we uh, ourselves can be prone to erect. You know, the zealot party had a lot to be said for. He said, who's right, the zealots with their palm branches or Caesar? The zealots are right. Ish, ish. Um, certainly the Romans are wrong in every way. Um, and if I had to pick sides, well, I'd pick the zealot. You know, 
in my pre-conversion state, I'd probably, I'd been in one of the two, I don't know, <laughs> but that's where I'd have been found. Um, it's not by chance that they choose Barabbas, right? And he's a, he's a terrorist is what he is. Well, the Romans call him a terrorist. The other side always calls him freedom fighters. <laughs> but uh, the, um, Jesus is going to come to reign on a cross. And his message to this world, the time is coming when he does mount a war horse. Revelation 9 is not fiction. It's not fantasy. It is future. The time of the gospel is going to end. And he is going to come, and the biblical imagery of Re Revelation 19 is very stark. I think I mentioned it during the prophecy of Judah uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he's going to drench himself, treading the winepress of the wrath of God the Almighty. But that is not the time we're living in. Now the time is the message of the humble, gracious Savior who comes not to... Uh, to, to, to give victory to us or them, but to save sinners through his death on the cross. Well, um, I, I think what's particular, the result of this, of course, is that the crowd is very enthusiastic for Jesus. You know, they're going to lose that enthusiasm during the week because <laughs> Jesus is going to decidedly not meet their expectations and they're going to choose Barabbas over him. The same crowd is going to cry out, crucify uh, because he does not meet their expectations uh, but one of the result is and John 12 19 makes this very clear as a result of this episode the Pharisees go that's it we've got to get rid of him and it was this entry and the manner of it that Jesus deliberately provoked it seems this is exactly what he intended would be the case uh, harden the resolve of the religious leaders that we must do him in now. And unlike previous times, when he had snuck in, as it were, he'd come in secretly. Jesus is not above exercising prudence when prudence is, the, is, the, is what's called for. But not this time. There's no prudence. He's being public. Now, I think it's fascinating here at the end of it. And, and it's interesting, all the different accounts of the, of the triumphal entry are selective in their details because of the theological purpose they're giving. And I think Mark's is fascinating. Look at verse 11. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. During the Passion Week, Jesus was, he didn't sleep in Jerusalem. He was in Beth Bethany. He would go back and forth between the town. He was staying with Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And... Uh, he makes the triumphal entry in this public way, and where does he go? He goes to the temple, and as Mark tells it, he looks around. Isn't that fascinating? By the way, this morning in my devotions, I, was, uh, I, did, I do three Old Testament chapters, and this morning it was 1 Kings 4, 5, 6, including ch for chapter 6 is the, the building of the temple with Solomon, and Jesus is the rebuilt second temple that Jesus is in. But isn't it fascinating that Jesus goes through all this careful preparation. He performs a staggering miracle in the most public way. He's got this mass crowd that's got his names on every lips. He then arranges for a, a colt of a donkey that's never been ridden. And he's going to ride as the Davidic king into the city with the people responding enthusiasm. And he, where does he go? He goes to the temple. Uh, what a fascinating thought. Now, what is in that? Well, what was the temple? The temple were, was with, where God met with man. And it is true that they, they didn't make a replica of the Ark of the Covenant, but they did make a replica of everything else. And a lot of the events in Jesus' Jerusalem ministry took place in the temple courts, the court of the Gentiles. A lot of it was in the court of the women. That's where the treasury was. That's where the Sanhedrin met. That's where those big, that's where the light festival took place. That's where the water pouring festival. He could go into the court of the men. I doubt that he went inside the temple. I don't know. I don't think this is definite because he's not a Levite. But I could be wrong. Maybe he did go in. Had he gone in, he would have seen the, we know they made a menorah because the Arch of Titus shows them carrying the menorah in the triumph that Titus had after destroying Jerusalem. And they would have had the table of the showbread. And what was Jesus seeing? He was seeing emblems anticipating all that he came to do. 
Uh, the table of the showbread is related to his I am the bread of life and he is the giver of eternal life. And the menorah, I am the light of the world. He came to shine the light uh, of God to men. The whole temple is the place where God dwelt amongst his people. When you get to 1 Kings 8 and 9 where, where Solomon prays, the Shekinah glory fills the temple. And it was the, the symbology in such a very tangible way of what this is all about. God has come to be with his people and they will be his people and he will be his God. What is Jesus thinking when he does that? He, he's committed himself. He's provoked his crucifixion on Friday. It's, it's Sunday on the next Friday. He goes into the temple. What, what's on, I mean, he must have been opening his heart to the Father and saying what this is about. And, and see, the agenda that we bring to the world, our witness to our family members, our witness to neighbors, is that uh, the true and living God desires to live among his people. He desires to be known. He desires to tabernacle. Isn't that what John says about Jesus' whole incarnation? He, he became flesh and he tabernacled, he templed among us so that we might know him that we might draw near to him and worship and to be blessed by him. And Jesus, having committed himself finally to the cross, he goes to the temple and he looked around at everything. Well, later on that week, he will say, destroy this temple. See, it's all temporary. And I, the one that I build uh, will not be torn down. In fact, Luke's gospel tells us that on the way of this journey, he got off his donkey and he wept over Jerusalem and he prophesied in great detail the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 because they were not repentant. And all the earthly was going to fall away, but the true spiritual temple that he was going to achieve would be accomplished by his death on the cross. One thing it says to us is, friends, there is no Christianity apart from the atoning death of Jesus. At the very center, I like to say, it's not enough for us to be committed to the cross of Christ and his bloodshedding atonement for our sins. It's not enough in the circle of our convictions that it's somewhere in there. That's good. <laughs> you can't be a Christian without it being in there. No, it needs to be at the center of who we are and what our faith is. The atoning death of the Lamb of God, the, 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 the Savior who came humbly as a sacrifice, riding on a donkey who comes into the temple, that he would, he's presenting himself as the sacrifice. The temple was really, he, it existed in the Old Covenant so that sacrifices could be made there. And he's presenting himself there at the very heart of who we are. Is What does Paul say? I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do trust looking around that every one of you has come to the cross and said that is the, the very heart of my hope, it's the very essence of what it means for me to be a Christian, that I come as a sinner, that this Jesus would die for me. This is the message we must give to the world. And let me lastly say, it's the one that gives the true glory. I mentioned the Roman triumph. There was one feature of the Roman triumph that was very interesting because uh, on the chariot with the conqueror as he came, laurel crowned, wearing his white robe, was a slave. And the slave stood behind him, and what did he whisper in his ear? That all glory is fleeting. <laughs> well, not the glory that Jesus gives. The glory that he would achieve by the cross, reigning from the cross, would lead him to be ascended to the right hand of God. His glory would not be fleeting. He will return. He will grant salvation to all his people. He will establish the kingdom of righteousness that will never end. But now is the time of the gospel of his cross. The calling we have is to proclaim the Lamb of God, sacrifice for sins. By that means alone will sinners be saved. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus, his remarkable behavior, so consistent with the prophecies. No one else could even possibly fulfill those prophecies but Jesus, Lord. But how wonderful that he did it out of love for me and for us. And help us as we leave tonight to to realize that such is the love of Jesus for us, that he presented himself, he provoked his own murder, 
that we might be forgiven of our sins, that we might know you, that we might be your people, that you through your Holy Spirit might tabernacle in our midst. And someday, Lord, that we would be part of that eternal holy of holies, dwelling in the light of your glory forever and ever. How we long for his return. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's uh, rise. We'll sing the doxology.